Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time. Don sitting in the host chair today, being joined by Chris. It's been a while since you and I have had a chance to record together, Chris. So it's uh, good good to see you on my screen. Good to talk to you here and uh, have a chance to talk a little alternate history. Um, as has been mentioned uh, before, uh, for those of you that just heard the last two episodes, that was Chris and Robert going down the, the, the Tex-Mex combination path here recently and some of the other episodes that were there because I've been off getting a a co-founder of the podcast married, which has happened about a month ago. And uh, some other stuff have been going on that we don't even need to all go into, but just uh, hadn't got around to recording anything. So Chris and I are are jumping in here and we have some other stuff that's in the, in the, um, in the queue as well. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Doing great. Looking forward to, you know, getting back into podcasting. Getting back into podcasting. So uh, the topic today, not to leave our listeners in suspense, is going to be about what we commonly call the Einstein letter. And that was written in 1939, specifically was uh, August, early August of 1939 uh, by physicist and um, I guess recent American citizen at that point. I'm trying to remember when his citizenship was. Mm-hmm. But but he's been an immigrant to the United States. Einstein um, is here in the United States, and he's writing to President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt about something that's come to his attention. And for most most of us that are students of history have always heard that, well, this was FDR becoming aware of the the possibility of nuclear weapons, and it comes from Einstein and See Everything Manhattan Project and topics that at least, as Chris and I were talking off podcast, indirectly or directly 10 or 15 other episodes of a fork in time that run around the concept of nuclear weapons and world war ii and and the things that go with that Uh, we wanted to explore this because um and i think we'll get into the details of this and it's yet to be determined but we sometimes talk about these dates that are considered to be important that may not be as important as we think they are that's actually one of the flavors of alternate history is well the alternate's really not that different than the primary in some way, shape, or fashion. What Alexis and I sometimes call the detours. That's where you exit you exit the road and you take the detour, but you come right back to it. So nothing really changed. There was no fork other than you forked off and you came back. And I think we may end up with this one in something like that, but we'll talk it through and by what it means. But I was struck as I was getting ready as I set up the historical what did here, Chris, about the things that I sort of knew about this but had forgotten and sort of many of the misnomers, I think, around this. First of all, the title of the episode, we already decided what the title of the episode is going to be, is Wait a Minute, Mr. Postman. Um, this letter from Einstein to FDR was not sent with a stamp stuck on it, you know, attention, attention, White House, somebody in the White House mail room. So oh, this is from Albert Einstein. Maybe the president would actually like to read this. It's actually hand delivered by uh, Alexander Sachs, who is uh, had long been a confidant of the president on economic matters and someone that's decided by the group of authors. I'm just going to call them the authors of the letter because there's more than one and we'll talk about them, that this needed to get in front of the president. Actually, more than anyone else, if you wanted to really identify who this um, the author of this is, it's actually a, uh, a physicist, a Hungarian physicist by the name of Szilard. There's a silent Z in there, S-Z-I-L-A-R-D. And uh, he is well known, Chris, and I know you can speak to a lot of this because of other things we've talked about. He's well known in what's been going on in nuclear research really for about the past decade. Things like nuclear fission. Uh, he's heavily involved in that, working uh, with some of the things that lead to Fermi and some of the, the early things that happened in Chicago. Um, I think the average American wouldn't even know this person by name, certainly wouldn't know them by sight the same way they would if they saw a picture of Einstein. But this is no physicist slouch that we're talking about here, right? He's not. He He's the one who has, frankly, the chops in this. Um, he's the person who's done the research. He and Fermi, they're both very important in the American effort um, at or. Not even let me take that back. 
it's not the American effort. There is no American effort. These are just academics discussing the theoretical possibility that we might be able to do something about this. Um, so there's, n- you know, and, and, and I have to correct myself. There, there's no direction to this. These are kind of a bunch of people sitting around talking, thinking 20, 30 years in the future, we might be able to do something about this. Um, even in the letter itself, it is pretty far off from where we were five years later, almost exactly five years later, six years later, with having a deliverable system. In fact, one of the things that struck me in reading the background here, so just to you know, fill in the gaps a little bit there, uh, Szilard, I guess, and uh, Vigner realize they want to communicate that there's a risk here. And the risk is really about there's a limited supply of uranium in the world. Who's going to have access to the uranium who would be able to do anything? And this includes the fact that uh, one of the sources of that is in Czechoslovakia. So there's concerns about German control over that source and the fact that there aren't many other good sources. And you're right. When they, when they start talking about the ability for this to be converted to a weapon, at this point, they're assuming something that would actually be delivered on a ship. In fact, the example that you'll find in the letter, which I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to the actual text of the letter, which I was also struck by how short the letter actually is. It, it's, it's a two page double space. You know, it's, it's not a 22 page X, uh, you know, um, exhortation. It's, not a thesis. It, it's not a thesis on anything except that, you know, here's some ideas about maybe what you ought to be doing. And here's the concern is this could be converted to a weapon. At that point, the assumption is that you're talking about measuring something in tons. It would not be able to be delivered uh, by a plane dropping a bomb, which of course, as we know, is the first expression of this in its, in its military use in combat. Mm-hmm. You know, so the example that's in there is where maybe you can, you can sail this into a port on a ship, blow it up and the entire port and the area around it could be still a powerful weapon, but the idea of how it would be delivered, what the requirements for delivery are, are very different than, as you said, what the reality was just six years later. Mm-hmm. I, 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 one, that it would destroy the port and the surrounding area, not basically the metropolitan complex, which is what happened to the port of Nagasaki. Correct. And that it would be able to be delivered, like we said, via airplanes, because just the the issue was how much material. That's what took so much research. We know that uranium can be split. That research had already been done by Fritsch in Germany um, in early 39. But then the debates and the arguments are over how much whether it's 239 or sorry 238 or 235 that you can use those are two different isotopes of uranium without getting too much into the physics up until now all we've ever done is separate elements nobody even knows if you can separate isotopes to refine out the 238 to get to enough pure 235 to do this right and and the the enhancement of the and the as you point out there you know the pro the big breakthrough wasn't the ability to, to isolate the isotopes and then and then do what you needed to do to get a, a critical quantity of the desired isotope which was more effective at doing what you were looking to do and and that process of enhancing in the enhancement process was, you know, the, the big breakthrough. And that's what changed, Mo- moved the decimal on, on the, the amount of material that was required. And thus obviously took something that was potentially a pretty devastating weapon. But the fact that you would have to sail a weapon into the harbor versus delivering it from a plane is a very different mode of delivery in terms of its practical military usage. And, uh, and that was a big thing here. And of course, the other part, uh, you know, again, some of the misnomers about the letter, uh, in fact, it, Reportedly, when Einstein was sort of first met with them and briefed on them, his thing was obviously here's a guy who knew things about what was going on in you know nuclear research and fission fission research. And he's like, 
hadn't really thought about the fact that you could turn that into a weapon. You know, this was almost a novel concept to Einstein, but intriguing enough and concerning enough to him that he's willing to put his valuable name on this letter, knowing that that will help it get the attention that it needs. For for those of you that are a fan of a certain show about physicists, I feel like this is a good understanding of Sheldon and Leonard from the Big Bang. Einstein's the theoretical physicist. He's done the underpinnings of it. Zillard is the experimental or the person who's taking these ideas and actually turning them into something. Right. Where that probably never did even cross Einstein's mind. And obviously bright enough to understand what somebody's mentioned that to him. Oh, yeah, that's a reality. And, and he's concerned about it. Um, but uh, like, like you say, just a different approach to the problem and what's going on there and what's happening. So in the real historical timeline, the letter actually drafts of it sort of go back and forth in various languages. Eventually, it ends up in English. There's a great story about it being dictated uh, on the other end uh, before it comes back to back to Einstein and uh, the person, the, the 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 female secretary who's taking the dictation thinks she's working for somebody who's crazy because of what's in the letter. And oh, by the way, it's being signed, going to be signed Albert Einstein, you know, and that's not who's dictating it to her. But eventually, it does find its way into the hands of of Sachs again, Alexander Sachs, who's going to hand deliver it to the president. He agrees to do that. And so, while it's drafted in early August, when does it actually show up in Roosevelt's hands, Chris? So. It shows up in in Sachs. Sachs's hands. He has it on August fifteenth. That that's going to become important. A uh, couple of things happened very very soon afterwards, like World War Two starts, and Sachs realizes that as as anybody who works in a large organization, when the boss is focused on something else, if you want your project paid attention to there are sometimes you just have to sit on it for a little bit so sack sits on the letter until october once basically at this point poland has fallen and we've entered the period of the phony war at this point sax thinks you know what now i can actually have somebody pay attention to this right. and so what happens when sax finally delivers the letter chris um, as much as I admire FDR, he did a very FDR thing. He promised to form a blue ribbon study commission of this, and then he just passed it off to them. So he doesn't ignore it. Right. It, it does get his attention being hand delivered. I think probably having Einstein be the signatory and who it's supposedly from has has some credence and has some value. It's not just some, you know, quote unquote crackpot mm -hmm. out there with a the notion. But to your point, they, they form a basically a uranium study commission is what they and and you'll see this in the text of the letter. When you read the letter, the action that Einstein most fervently suggests is be aware of the fact that getting control of the source, getting control of uranium, knowing who's got it, who doesn't have it, you know, these types of things is the major thrust. If you talk about the action item that Einstein's recommend, he basically does recommend just circulate this around in the right circles inside the government. So FDR sort of, sort of does that. And it's not develop a massive program, which we will later call Manhattan, to make this operational. It's just be aware and, hey, you know, think about where the uranium is and who's going to have control of it. At this point, and I believe to this day, the United States has a strategic helium reserve. Right. Just in case we need to get into balloons again. Very similar thing. We need to just have some uranium sitting around just in case it becomes useful at some point. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing I was reading and doing some of the background research is that uh, the Germans do start Czechoslovakia being one of the sources where there are, are resources that are there. They start restricting the export of that as a resource. So they're, they're now hoarding the uranium that they have control of and access to. There's some sources, I think, in, 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 in the Belgian Congo and some of the places in Africa. There's a, there's a source in Canada, that there's a source in Canada, which is, which is you know, nearby and close. Mm -hmm. But it's not like everywhere in the world has access to this. And so that's you know, the primary thing that comes out of this, as you said, is FDR creates a working group, a panel, a committee, 
it's not ignored. It's not a high priority. Uh, and pretty much what Einstein has suggested is, you know, pay attention to where the uranium is and who's got the uranium. That gets accomplished. Um, and so, again, uh, we were talking about this off podcast. This is where I want to go as we start transitioning now over to the what if here in just a moment is this idea of um, the way that this was sort of told to me in the simple form of history was Einstein sends a letter, gets FDR's attention, fast forward Manhattan Project, fast forward man, post Manhattan Project, now deliverable bomb that ends up being dropped at the end of World War II. Uh, after the, the European theater has closed down, but the, but the Pacific theater is still active. That's the, maybe you hear about this in eighth grade American history or 11th grade American history version of the story. Einstein to FDR, FDR to eventually to a program, program produces the weapon, end of story, you now know enough to pass the test. Even to this day, I think a lot of people picture Einstein camping out in the, New Mexico desert as as somebody actually participating in the Manhattan Project, which is also not true because uh, Hoover basically says we've had a file on this guy for a while. We've read some of his other stuff. At best, he's a pacifist. At worst, he's a communist. And and he's by the way, yes, yes, he's an, he's an American now, but we're not going to trust him with anything important. So to your point, he's not even part of that dream team of scientists that you know become the manhattan project it, to be fair there were plenty of communists among them too <laughs> <laughs> right right uh, and again this is just the case of einstein is the most notable one he, he he's actually come to the attention of the fbi in ways but, that some of the others haven't but one of the other things one of the reasons i think they left him off was one of the things that scared the west Great Britain, the United States at this point was in January of 39, Otto Hahn publishes his work saying uranium fission is possible. And then he doesn't do anything else. Then he drops off the face of the scientific world. And what the rest of the world takes this as is he's in some bunker doing secret research so einstein as being very high profile we want him teaching undergrads at princeton we want to publicize that because that way he's he's obviously not doing anything else right as you said that chris the thing that popped into my head which is such an important part of Allied success in World War II is about the things that are and the things that appear to be. And the, the example that I think of is the role that Patton played ahead of Overlord in terms of being the decoy. You know, the Germans were convinced you're going to have Patton lead this thing. He, he's the only obvious choice. He would have been their choice. And so they can't imagine a scenario where this, you know, coalition led thing led by a guy who's brilliant with logistics, but not much else called Eisenhower, even though he's got that title is really the guy that's at play here is that it's the opposite of that. As you, as you said, it's, 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 um, well, if he's doing that, he's not doing this. Okay. But there are other people that are doing things <laughs> which are very important. And, you know, yeah, I've read so many things to me, to me, it's just a fascinating thing, not just about what was going on in the New Mexico desert, obviously where the primary project was, but things that are going on in places like, um, I guess in Tennessee, where they're doing some of the stuff that's around the enrichment work and some of the other places, I mean, it's kept as a secret incredibly well, actually given all things that are there, but it's so big, you can't keep it absolutely secret. So even the people that are working on it don't even realize what they're doing and how they fit into the big picture. There are only a few people that really mm -hmm. understand how all the pieces fit. Right, right. And to me, that's, you know, it's, it, we probably will have, we definitely will have at some point uh, on our on our other show, The Room Where It Happened, probably a room where it happened that's around the Manhattan Project because it's worth having that worth having that discussion around because of what it is because i think it's just one of those fascinating mm -hmm. we find out more about it also all the time things that have become declassified in the last decade that we didn't know about before for example that i've read some things on as well so uh 
what we're going to look at here, Chris, we talked about there are two possible forks to explore here. So let's talk briefly about both of them. And then we'll talk about which one we think is the more interesting one to pursue and why. So uh, we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, Chris, I'm going to let I'm going to set up the one that I sort of talked about. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you set up the one, which I think is the far more intriguing one, the one that we're going to explore. The first fork that I thought about was what happens if this letter is not written, this letter is not delivered in the time frame that it is. Basically, we'll call it Einstein letter delayed, for lack of a better way of describing this. And so the first place that my brain goes on that particular fork is what is the ripple effect of that delay? in terms of getting something like the Manhattan Project going. Okay, if you, the Manhattan Project doesn't start when it does, it theoretically doesn't finish when it does, you don't have the work product that you do when you do, then you lay that against the template of the timeline of real history and say, okay, now you've reached August of, 19, of, 18, of 1945. 1845, that'd be a whole different, that would be a whole different timeline. Also, I'm just gonna say this, I we've done some work in the 1800s, never have we brought it. It, it we always bring the 19s back we never bring the 18s forward Teens forward i agree and um but so you get to august of 1945 when in the real timeline of course we all know august 6th and august 9th are the important dates there we've talked about all the reasons why see previous episodes which i can link to at infinitum almost now in the show notes uh about post-world war ii europe i mean uh, the pacific the post-world war ii pacific uh, powers being impacted by the American choice to drop to drop the bomb and deliver the bombs. And we've talked about the actual Japanese invasion of the Japanese homeland as another way of ending the Pacific War and what that would have meant. So the first place that I go is if you're delayed, you suddenly find yourself in August, well, let's call it the fall and into the winter of 18 of 1945 without the ability to, to end the war quickly by dropping a bomb. And so the ripple effect is no August of 1939 letter means that by the time you get to August of 19 of, of 1945, you don't have Truman even with the option of dropping either uh, uh, you know little boy or fat man as a way to expedite the ending of the war. We've talked about before before the Soviets can really get it engaged in that you know all the things that would happen from that. We talked about that a little off podcast. We can talk about a little bit here, but. Your conclusion was, and I think you're spot on here, the letter really didn't set anything into motion in such in such a way to begin with that even if it's delayed by whatever amount of time you want to delay it, in this case, it was was delayed two months because of the events of the outbreak of the war and actually, you know, someone feeling like they would sit in front of Roosevelt and deliver this to them. Apparently, it was read to him by Sachs. That's, you know, it wasn't just delivered. It was hmm. delivered and read to him. Is that, okay, you delay too much, you delay x number of months to your point you really haven't delayed anything and the reason for that is what nothing really happens here other than the formation of a commission right 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 on the other side when you really look at the history when we were talking about this you kind of mentioned that getting back to that seventh grade u.s history version of this this was on a listicle as one of the 10 most important days in American history, this letter. Yeah. It's not. But there is a day which is, I would, and we're going to talk about that. This is our for much more important for it, much more important for the development of the atomic bomb in the United States, and much more important for technology in general. Um, we're going to get to that, Okay, but go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I had the other fork being the letter reaches the hands of Alexander Sachs, August 15th of 1939. And he is actually able to get in front of the president within a week. So he um, he went ahead and got his meeting on August 22nd. So he goes into the meeting on August 22nd and he explains this to the president. The president thinks this is a very good idea. 
And the next day, when Roosevelt has his to-do list and he's going to follow up on this, the newspapers let him know about the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is the deal between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. It shocks the world, and anybody who knows anything, or even at this point kind of has access to a map, knows that Poland is in trouble right now. Uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia hated each other. They had been kind of fighting proxy wars all over the world. And now they're on the same side. Everybody looks at this and realizes Poland's next. This starts a crisis. And within a week, the um, radio station at Glywitz is hit by Polish saboteurs dressed as um, Polish saboteurs. They're German prisoners. And World War II begins. So... August 23rd begins a crisis leading up to the beginning of World War II. The United States isn't involved, but the United States is distracted. The entire world is distracted. Roosevelt is busy dealing with this latest fire going up. And so this committee from these academics gets put off. And almost it might even be worse for the committee than delaying the delivery until October because now it's been delivered and nobody's following up on it and nothing happens because the next day the world fell apart. Right. And so it's 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 not even the case of falling. It's not in the case of being delayed. It, it has the appearance of falling on deaf ears. No one knows how to follow up on it. Or, you know, as you said, other stuff is happening that has a higher priority. So it just, if it's still even on the radar, although radar is an interesting thing for me to reference here because of things that happened down the road that we were talking about off podcast is um, it's, it's worse because you're aware of it, but it's at the bottom of the stack. If it, if it's even still there at all, because other things have come along versus later when at least gets the chance to be, front and center and then a decision gets to be made about it right and let's fast forward in the development of the atomic bomb to october 1940 about a year later and what i would argue might well be the most important day in history in this chain that you probably have never even heard about and that is the Tizard mission. The Tizard mission was an effort by the United Kingdom to interest the United States in the war, to get them technologically involved in it in some way, basically to show off some toys that the British had that might interest the Americans. Um So there was a scientific mission sent to the United States. Uh, It included samples of British radar, which had just won the Battle of Britain. It included samples of cavity magnetrons, which were tiny little radio receivers, which become super important in what are called VT fuses, which are proximity fuses. Instead of having to hit airplanes, you can get close enough, and it is extremely important for the United States, especially in the Pacific, to be able to use these fuses and kill planes with a tenth of the number of shots it took earlier. So that's nice. Radar, VT fuses, um, jet engines are included as part of this. Piston engines, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine that is in the uh, – go ahead and do the speech. Uh, Chris, is, Chris has seen this so often because it's the – actually, Chris, I didn't have any mention to you. That the, the, the picture that's on the wall behind me, the version of that picture is also in my office 
Uh, I have I have this twice. My my favorite um, military plane of all time is the P fifty is is the North American P fifty one D variant of the Mustang. Um, I think it's one of the most in terms of just the elegant lines, its importance, its significance. Uh, so if I, I may, before this is all said and done, tell a little bit of the story behind why that is, because of something that happened to me as a kid growing up. But one of the things I know about the P-51, and I specify the P-51D, which has the bubble canopy, which is one of the things that makes for the gorgeous lines. And the other things that are there, it has the um, the, the air intake on the bottom that we're so familiar with is what's in that, that, that plane, which uh, Chris had pointed out is on the wall behind me. He said, move your head, mm-hmm. remind me of what's there <laughs> is a P-51D is the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. And it took an average or maybe even slightly below average American fighter aircraft in the original version of the P-51D and gave it range and performance and speed. That engine in the P-51D is the magic of the P-51D. That's not an American engine. That's a the Rolls Royce Merlin engine. And not only that, if you think of the British bombing campaign, the Lancasters had four of those in every single one of those. Um, so you've got this treasure trove, not to mention the rocket technology that they did let the United, whatever they had on rocket technology, uh, nowhere near what the Germans did. And they included something called the Maud Report. The Maud Report was a lot of the work done by both British scientists and that had been smuggled out of what is now occupied Europe. Uh, And it includes a lot of the further steps in the process. It includes information on is isotope separation doable what isotope do you need if you can and and this is the first time we mentioned earlier about delivery size uh mod report tells them if you can purify 235 you need 10 till 10 kilograms a p51 could deliver 10 kilograms right and so you go from what we were talking about earlier which is exactly speculated again in the letter you know you would deliver this <clears throat> port destroying bomb by ship mm-hmm. because of the, you're talking about tons of material that are required now you're talking about uh not not even a ton you could deliver a one ton bomb absolutely if you had to deliver a one ton bomb you're talking, as you said something that could be delivered you know strapped underneath any fighter bomber or any you know either any fighter mm-hmm. plane when you get down to to you know a weapon now that's going to be measured in um in three digit kilograms and not more than a thousand pounds and um that makes a big difference in terms of you know the thinking about how this can be weaponized but other things as well and i agree this is one of those things that um that, which is always what's fascinating me about history i learn something new every every day if i'm focused on it is that you know the average the average school kid might be able to describe the FDR letter. They can't tell you about, you know, a British delegate a British delegation led by Tizard bringing over goodies for show and tell, and also you know other documents as well. So, this is why we we picked up on this because this is where really I think the United States efforts. This is where I think we can start talking about a United States effort. Um, this kind of gets taken out of the circle of academic discussion and starts getting industrial, starts getting economic backing behind it. And if you don't, so when Tizard comes over, when this, when they start unboxing all of these goodies, you can see sending Ford or General Motors, the Merlin engine. You can send Bell the jets to get them working on that. You can send General Electric and Raytheon the radar technology. But if the uranium committee got lost in the shuffle, then this gets lost in the shuffle. This is this is 
how it could really affect the development, which was while we may not have done much work between August, October 39 and October 1940, there was somebody to hand this off to. Right. That somebody that already somebody that already existed to right. hand this off to versus saying, oh, now we need to go and, you know, form the team. We need to go figure out there was already at least that mechanism was in place. And so I think that can seriously delay all of the development. So if we follow this premise of this of this being the fork that we want that we think is the more um, uh, the fork that has more traction, I'll, I'll just put it that way in terms of its impact. We are then talking about a, uh, a delay, the delay I talked about, the ripple through time of, of the delay on this. And I think the first place that I went in my head, I mentioned it sort of in the thing that I covered about the first fork that I was thinking about, I think about its impact on the end of World War II, the way that we know it. And I think that's real. You would have had a different thing. I think it's a very different end of World War II if there's actual American slash allied invasion of Japan's home islands. I mean, that's a mm-hmm. very different scenario. You know, everything I've ever read, watched, or ingested there is the numbers get scary really quick. And in some cases, they may all be underestimates despite how scary they are. But what you suggested really intrigued me when we were talking in the preparatory discussion off podcast, which is, is it really about that? Or is it really about what happens post-war? So what were you thinking there, Chris? So all of this work is delayed one year. Um, If you remember, and I'm going to go ahead and specifically talk about, if I'm being perfectly honest, this is probably when I talk to new people, this might be my favorite episode we've ever done. It was... Brody, yourself, and myself talking about if a Japanese secret weapons project had actually had an effect. Um, If you look at that, it's remarkable when you look at when the industrial production facilities started coming online. We're talking about 1944 when Oak Ridge, when Hanford, which are the two production facilities, really start taking off because having actually been to them, these are big buildings. These are just just the sheer construction of these buildings took a long time. And so you've got a situation where Now it's night instead of October 44, it's October 45. The first thing is the German war is over. The, the entire idea of the Manhattan project was to produce something in case the Germans also got something. And the fact is that by At the latest March, probably earlier, the United States and the Western allies had realized that the reason Otto Hahn went dark is because he just wasn't working on anything, that the German program was all over the board. They were working on dead end technology, whether that was intentional by Heisenberg or not is is still something Debated, but they were nowhere near a development of an actual deliverable device. So, if the Germans aren't working on it, why are we building industry? Why are we building factories? Uh, If you have ever watched a movie, I want to say it was the early 90s uh, called The Manhattan Project. Uh, John C. McGillney, who, if you can picture him, he's he's in it as as a radiation doctor who had, you know, he's playing a, a doctor in the Manhattan Project. And he says, we're not building two devices. We're building hundreds of devices. That's what Hanford, that's what Oak Ridge were designed to do, to build 
the numbers that we have today to build the numbers that we had in the 1960s before we even started thinking about control. Maybe you stop those, especially if Germany doesn't have it. I tend to think Japan may have still surrendered in August with the Soviet intervention, but certainly into August 45. Gee, do we do we do we need to keep pouring money into this? We're, we're going to win the war the old fashioned way. So maybe we don't. Um, and we've talked about, you know, we touched on a lot of other stuff. Here's the implication, which I think whetted Don's appetite. So that's where we're going with this one, because, you know, we'll talk about the same thing three or four different ways, but we're always going to come a different approach to it. Um, United States defense policy after the war was we're going to have an independent air force. We're going to have a couple of squadrons of B-29s and our allies all over the world so that we can deliver nuclear weapons wherever we need to. And all we are ever going to have to do is draw a line and say, if you cross this, we'll use it. And we can then use that kind of blackmail instead of any other defense capacity. We don't need an army. We don't need Navy. We don't need anything else. We just need atomic bombers. We may not have that in this scenario. So what comes to mind from there? Well, I just, you know, the thing that I went to immediately was, okay, what does that mean in, you know, uh, the Korean conflict? You know, where mm -hmm. we, we have a different U.S. military posture that's ready to respond to that or e even how that plays further along. This is since we were talking off podcast, I start thinking through um, the types of things that were, were discussed around some of the stuff that we did around um, – uh, the Kennedy stuff and Cuba and all of the other things, you know, you know, a Curtis LeMay very much is a, is a, um, is a product of uh, World War II and what the U.S. was able to do through air power and extending that to its ultimate expression, because you have this, as you just said, you have this ultimate expression of what that power means, which is, you know, I got, I got 20 bombs in the planes to deliver them anywhere in the world. And that's all I'm ever going to need. Air Force, so, baby, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so the question becomes the United States did slash defense spending in, in the 48 Congress after the war. Um, there's really two ways to think about if the United States doesn't develop the bomb. One, does it disband the military of the First World War? of the second world war like we did after the first world war do we send all of that manpower all of those resources back or does the united states somehow the united states after world war ii committed itself to the world committed itself to the defense of europe through the marshall plan through nato through all of these things but we were definitely up until 1950 in korea like you mentioned we were definitely working under the assumption that it would not be convention. We would not have a draft. We would not have the economic commitment to defense spending like we did. So do you think it's a matter of we just have the roll down we saw or do we maintain conventional forces to keep up our presence in Europe? I think we would have to be more convinced, more committed than we ultimately became to the conventional because there would not be the unconventional nuclear deterrent. Mm -hmm. And then we, then we talked about, you know, the, the timing of that worked because we were the, it worked, it worked in the real timeline because we were the exclusive member of the club for four years. It's the, the Soviets come along with, with their first, you know, test and demonstration in 49 and so once that happens, now you've changed the calculus, you've changed the balance, you know, everything gets changed there. But, <clears throat> you know, and we talked about this a little bit, and I, and I don't know if I know the answer to this question. I just think it's an intriguing mm -hmm. thing to ask is, 
because a lot of people, yeah, yeah, let me take the step back. A lot of people ask why the second bomb? Okay, Hiroshima, I get the justification for Hiroshima, right? Uh, you, you're demonstrating the weapon, you're demonstrating the weapon, you know, against a target for the reasons you're demonstrating the weapon against a target. Uh, you want to do it when you're doing it. We've talked about this before because, you know, the Soviets are about to lay in and have their claim uh, to what's going on. You're trying, you know, you're already thinking about avoiding or what you're going to do in, in the post-war or the next war scenario versus the current one. But sending people pictures of the bomb blowing up in the New Mexico desert versus seeing what actually happens at Hiroshima, is is that perceived differently? You know, it, 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 or if you, and if, you, if you don't have it in 45, and so maybe it's, you know, 47 before you, here's the pictures of us blowing this thing up in the desert. Oh, by the way, we can use this. We have a way of delivering this. Um, I just don't know if it has the same effect as a unilateral deterrent that did exist in the real world beginning in 1945 until, you know, we moved to a different type of deterrence. We moved to mutual assured deterrence. Eventually it becomes deterrence through mutual assured destruction, but initially it's deterrence through, we have something you don't, don't mess with us. So two things. One, you talk about the Alamogordo test, the July 45 test. That was a working bomb dropped from a tower. Yes. Yes. Um, you can certainly take pictures of this giant sphere and tell the world that that's what actually did it. But how much, how, um, how much credence do people put into it? And by the way, just to follow up on that, the Mike test, the first test of a hydrogen, of a thermonuclear, of a fission weapon, um, that definitely was not air deliverable. That was one of those circumstances where we set something up. We set up a facility to blow this thing up. Right. That would not have been deliverable. Um, but to think about what you said about why August 9th was to show that this was not theoretical. This was not a theoretical gadget. Not only did we have it, but we had... We were doing what the United States did in World War II, which is we were mass producing it. Right. And, we, and, not only, and not only that, but two different styles of weapon driven by two different you know, concepts. We have, we have version A and version B of this, too, by the way. And, and we have more than one of them. I, I, I don't think the <laughs> physics of implosion versus gun type device were really communicated. Just that we got two of them. Right. So that. We can, you know, you know what? Soviet Union probably would have been okay giving up Moscow. But Moscow, Leningrad, at this point, give Minsk, Smolensk, every major city. The fact that we can wipe out your cities, that we have multiple of them. Right. That was that was the point behind that. So, you know, sort of bringing this back around full circle, mm. the point that you raised was, you know, would there have been a different conventional U.S. doctrine without the, the nuclear timing that we had now? Tying it back to now the Einstein concept, in 47, he writes another letter. Mm -hmm. And the letter, or, or at least it becomes public, you know, is that he now really wishes that he hadn't have written the first letter because he saw what it, what it led to and produced. And so, the, you know, the thing that ran through my head was, okay, if you never getting around, if there's never been a nuclear weapon dropped in conflict, which is what this scenario would potentially lead to, you know, I think there's much more likelihood, not necessarily being the United States, but somebody else who would have developed one and to assume that the Soviets and others would not have developed what I think is a foolish notion. Uh, they, they would have been working just as they were uh, and, and had access to things just like they did, which would have led them down that path. But you know, until it's used and you see the devastating effects on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there's still somebody out there going, you know, we could use we could use one of these things and it wouldn't be the end of everything. And so I think there would have been a much higher probability of 
one side or the other during the Cold War, during some of the regional conflicts that were part of the Cold War, you know, being willing to use the weapon. I, I think the first use of the weapon would happen somewhere in Korea in, 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 a, in a different scenario in my head, uh, just because somebody would have said we have it. I think, you know, I can I think I can make a case mm -hmm. for in the justification for uh, particularly with somebody like a MacArthur at the helm, you know, of uh, pick a city, pick any city in the Korean conflict becomes becomes what we think of as Hiroshima today. Let's let's show them what this is about. I am actually going to turn this around on its head for a second. I think the first Hiroshima could be Nagasaki. And hear me out. Um, the United States, the war ends in August 45. The United States has been delayed and does not set up the industrial production that it does in our timeline. This is now seen as a boondoggle because we spent millions of dollars on this thing and didn't even use it. But here's the thing. All of the research, all of the calculations, all of the engineering, all of the science, all of the theory was done. And the Soviets had it. So while a United States, after every single war, the United States come cuts stuff back. And in our timeline, there was the discussion of disbanding the United States Navy. So if the United States is keeping up defense spending for conventional forces, I don't know if we go down the industrial path that we did. I do believe the Soviets would have. And I believe with what the information they had gained already from the Manhattan Project before it went into industrial production, they could have set it up on their own. So now they have it. We are not even monitoring for tests because we've never tested one ourselves. We're not, we don't even consider it. The shock that the Soviets were able to develop something in the course of four years is a lot of times missed. It was Buck Rogers stuff when we did it to think the Soviets did it. So Soviets have one. And let's quick recap. Promise it. I promise this is going to be short. Korean War. North Korea invades South. South Korea gets U.S. assistance, goes back right up to the Chinese border. The Chinese intervene with troops, and the United States just fights those troops. It does not do anything to the Chinese cities and the capacity supplying them. Yeah, it's a quote unquote limited war slash police action uh, under under UN mandate. So it's about it's about defending and restoring the status quo, not about producing something different. And if the United States does not industrially produce nuclear weapons, does not realize that Russia has them, we probably bomb industrial targets industrial and logistical targets in Manchuria using the conventional forces that we have. We, I think we talked about this on the other episode. More people died when we firebombed Tokyo than when we dropped two nuclear bombs. Correct. We had the capacity to level cities. If we don't think nuclear weapons are in play, that, that pulled Truman back. And if we don't know it, every bridge over the Yalu is bombed, without a doubt. Probably Harbin and other major industrial targets in Manchuria are hit. And the Soviets, and by the way, I'm not saying this is actually, but just to bring everything back together, I think it's interesting. The Soviets respond by attacking the American logistical hub on the island of Kyushu that is supplying our forces in Korea. And that hub is Nagasaki. Nagasaki. 
we bomb the Soviet side logistical hubs. They bomb our logistical hub. Yep. And <laughs> the thing that's easy for me to forget at times, Chris, because of just, you know, how you how I put the timelines mm. together in my head, you know, it's not that long from where the primary mode of delivery is bomb. So an, air, an airplane dropped weapon made possible by, again, um, see previous conversations about technology that mm -hmm. comes from the UK to the United States. You know, you're less than 15 years removed from before the Korean conflict and the Korean conflict until you're in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And what's different there is it's not called the Cuban bomber crisis. It's not called the Cuban uh, sail a nuclear capable ship with a bomb in, into the bay crisis. It's a missile crisis. And so the, what you're talking about there is being the extension of that change to conventional forces and the umbrella effect of nuclear as a result of now, now I don't even have to get my bombers invaded through your airspace. We're coming up and over. With, with, with missile capabilities, either short range, intermediate or continental, intercontinental ballistic missiles eventually. And, you know, that changes that that ultimately creates the, um, the backdrop for the Cold War then for, you know, several decades in terms of, yes, there are conventional outbreaks that are small in their mm -hmm. in the way they are through proxy wars. But there's no World War Three because of that deterrent and, and the fact that you cannot until the idea of SDI and Star Wars comes along in the 80s and earlier than that, a little bit with ABM technology limited by treaty. But there's no thought that you can really stop that. Once that starts, it's started. There's no defense no. for that. Even to this day, any any SDI is individual accidental launches. There's there's nothing right. that even suggests that could prevent any full scale exchange. Right. Um, and, and in fact, the original ABM treaty was you're, you're allowed to have one missile defense system around your capitals to, 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 to deal with uh, to deal with the accidental launch yeah. and maybe something about that. The idea that, you know, you're it, we, we might as well go ahead and limit them because it's uh, impractical to believe that they're going to be effective. And, you know, so even while you know, the nature of the Cold War, there were tremendous builds buildups of conventional weapons by both sides for the reasons that there were. But the conventional weapon buildup wasn't a theory that it's going to be a conventional war because nobody would take this nuclear. It was, in my opinion, it was the other side of that coin versus what you're described here as the possibility of you continue to have a conventional buildup because you don't have the idea that you're going to use nuclear weapons as a deterrent at all. Right. And, and the other thing I'm thinking about, one of the reasons Khrushchev loved nuclear weapons and missiles as much as he did is he looked at this very much the same way that Truman did. We can, we can spend a little bit of money on this and we don't have to spend that much on everything else. Right. And, uh, and again, you know, that, that, you know, one of the challenges that we always just the structure of what we do here at a fork in time, I mean, you always get to the point of, you just, you don't know, you have to speculate about what it is. Um, but I do think you could see a much different outcome post World War II. But if you look at a different, uh, uh, we've talked about here in the, the the departure that we've chosen, just a different receptiveness to this letter pre World War II. Mm -hmm. Not that it would have been, you know, the delay is not so much in the letter being delayed or did the letter happen or not happen, but the ripple is that some. A small thing was put into motion that a bigger thing later capitalized on. The Tizard mission is successful, as you said, because it's got a for fertile ground where some of this stuff can be handed off as relevant to who needs to know about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't have that, OK, yeah, you're talking about a couple of months delay there. A couple of months there may makes a difference. Yeah. And, and may, maybe makes a big difference because of the way that that, you know, assumes the same timeline ripples out forward. And now suddenly you're in, in 1945 and moving on there. So. I guess the other question I just want to pose here is we sort of hmm. try to bring things to the close. And if you've got some other thoughts, I want to hear them before we absolutely close out. But why are we so inclined to, again, I mentioned that part of what led me to this was seeing that listical type thing where this was like number three. Why are we prone sometimes to assume that some events may have more of a pivotal impact than if you really think them through, they probably do. Why do you think that is, Chris? So I think 
at least in terms of this letter, the reason it showed up on that list is the exact same reason that Einstein wrote it. Um, he's a big name, and he's a name that a lot of people know and associate with certain things. And the idea of him communicating with somebody else is is really interesting to people. It, it strikes me a little bit like the picture of Elvis and Nixon in the Oval Office. Here are two people that are rock stars in their respective worlds, but you don't imagine them crossing. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that Elvis, you know, I guess, you know, part of the irony of that is this was that was like some drug related thing. Like, you know, you know <clears throat> ironically, it's going to be, you know, prescribed pharmaceuticals that are going to do Elvis in. But, you know, here, 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 here's Elvis Presley in the war, uh, the war against drugs, you know, with Nixon. And again, ne neither of them could do anything about the war on drugs directly for the just, most part. You know, two people like um, I'm trying to think. Two people from different worlds colliding and and people find that interesting. It, it, it It's a way to get rock and roll people interested in who Richard Nixon is. Right. And, and and a safe way to get Nixon fans related to that long haired pop music. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it, it, and, and you know, I, I actually haven't even had had to pull it up here on the internet to see it i have i have an image of the picture in my head without needing without needing to pull it up and uh this is one of those cases where you know we often hear the phrase a uh, picture's worth a thousand words in this case the picture makes it a whole lot more important than what it really is to your point it, it, it's completely inconsequential in in anything but einstein talking to roosevelt it, it interests people Right. And, and then you and, and it becomes, you know, I, I guess the argument is also made that it becomes important in the retrospective looking back mm -hmm. because you're now looking. We're looking back at this event. This happened before I was born. So I have to look back at this event. We're looking back to this event through the prism of August 6th. Mm -hmm. And so now when we look at the things that happened in August of 39, not of 45, our view of them is back through that prism of August of 45. And so we now assign, we now assign weights and import to things based upon what we know is already. Well, of course it's important. That, that was a turning right. point. Right. Well, bec why? Because of what we already know, you know, when you're watching, I was watching a basketball game yesterday, uh, which my particular team didn't win. Uh, so I will not go back and comb through the DVR of the event, looking for the turning point in the game where they turned it around and surged to win because they never surged to win. So that same play that could have happened late in the first half becomes no more consequential because mm -hmm. I'm looking at it back through the lens of it was a loss, no matter what, where I've, I've done that before, where I've you know, gone back and watched a sporting event again, where I know oh, this is the turning point. It's only the turning point because I know what happened after the fact. And in this case, you know, the fact that Einstein wrote to FDR is important. Mm -hmm. It gains extra import because we know how things turned out. And then we assume that it had more impact, probably, as you well point out here, than it actually did. Other things had more impact than this did. They just, A, don't fit the Elvis rule. They're not as sexy. One of those Hungarian physicists mm -hmm. is no Einstein. And then, the, and then the other part being that it turned out the way that it did. So we give it the import that it does versus it turning out some other way. I think that's the trap of a lot of history is that we know we don't know the ultimate outcome always, but we know the outcome so far. And so that we read that back into everything that we're seeing and things get overemphasized or underemphasized as a result. Uh, the only other thing I'll say to that, you know, we talked about this off podcast. This the backdrop of where we are now is a war in Europe and the, the invasion of, of Ukraine. And it's so easy now, I was, watching, uh, I was watching several documentaries over the last month. It's so easy to go back and point out, uh, look at Putin here, look at what happened here, look at the, yeah, because of what's happened now. It's, it's easy to go back and connect the dots, which mm -hmm. is to say that there were people who were connecting the dots beforehand. But it's easy for everybody to connect the dots now versus the small number of people that were connecting the dots before. Any other thoughts? 
I feel like what you just touched is going to be super important to talk about the next thing we have coming out. You want to go uh, and tease that a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> we talked about that's where we would end up. And I didn't intentionally get us there, but I, I was heading us there. I think we're actually talking about a couple of things there. And we've mentioned the other show, The Room Where It Happens. And in fact, normally we're in the middle of a room where it happens. It's actually become meta inside of our shows now. Somebody, well, we just went really a fork in time there, you know, kind of thing. It's hard not to go down the it's hard not to go down the real history route. We spend a lot of time setting up the what did on a, a fork in time more than we should. And then the room where it happened, which is supposed to be more about the what did, we end up talking about the what ifs. That's just the nature of what we do and how these two things play together. But we're definitely going to be doing some, I think it's going to be multiple episodes, but certainly at least one a fork in time episode that's going to focus around the Yalta conference. And so this has this plays into Yalta because what's going on or what has happened or what is not going to happen there. And then one of our upcoming episodes of the room where it happens is actually going to be the Yalta conference. So we'll hit it from both perspectives and try to keep the alternate history on the alternate history podcast and the real history on the real history podcast, except where the two must meet in the middle. Right. But but also, I think the one thing we're really going to try and do is get the room where it happened out beforehand. Right. So that we reference it so that we don't feel like we have to talk about the real stuff. Yeah. And and, that, and that's something I, uh, we've talked about this on podcast and off podcast a lot with the team. You know, how, how much time should you spend on the what did? Because the what dids can mm-hmm. be really fascinating. Yeah. And that was the whole idea behind the room where it happened. It was a place to do the what dids justice as what dids and not. And you, yeah, you can you can you can touch on the speculation. That's a fair part of what's there. But I, I think what Chris just described there is something we'll find ourselves doing more and more of is using the one platform, which is much more designed for that to set up the background for a lot of folks for the other platform with a little bit more success. The only other thing I just want to mention, Chris, is we're closing out the show here. I really appreciate the listeners being to some degree patient over the last few months we've gone through. I mentioned the personal things, by the way, Alexis has a new last name now because that wedding has come and gone. And so she'll be getting back around to the podcasting on the bill on the podcast a little bit more now that she's passed that big event in her life. Uh, but it was, I've said this on essentially on air as well, but it's been really nice. One of the great things about this journey has been meeting the folks along the way. <laughs> and the fact that a lot of our episodes over the last three to four months where I was more heavily engaged in that and then some personal work life things. Um, it's a very nice thing to listen to a podcast episode of your own podcast that you're listening to it the first time the listener's listening to it, which I've had that experience mm. here a couple of times in the last couple of weeks uh, because of the way that episodes were produced, either by Chris or Robert or others that have been involved, uh, Eric, um, uh, Eric, uh, Eric Bond. We have Eric, we have two Eric's now. We have to keep mm-hmm. them straight. We've got a rush. We got a rush and a Bond. Um, but the uh, but the idea of you know it's, it's been a nice thing for me to go. Oh, I'm going to listen to a fork in time, and I have no idea what I'm about to hear, which is which has been a cool mm-hmm. place to go. And then the other thing, just again, the two podcasts playing off each other because remember what happens going to be coming up on its first year anniversary here before too much longer before mm-hmm. we turn around and we're pro- coming up on episode or room eight, room nine. So we're mm-hmm. approaching it, approaching a year here now is, is linking the two things together. One of the, I'll tease. The other thing I want to tease is what I'm really excited about because of the expertise that uh, Eric Rush brings as a doctor is this idea of looking at um, U.S. presidents in terms of health related things. We've done a little bit of that with some of the things that the William Henry Harrison uh, episodes to some degree here recently went along those lines, but that'll also get tied to a room where it happened as sort of probably being a launch off point mm-hmm. for that. So more of that's going to come as well. But uh, they, like I say, it, it, it was cool last week to listen to a fork in time entirely essentially as a listener, because I, I, I trust the team enough that I had not even pre-listened to what was posted uh, because I hadn't had the time to do it uh, dealing with some personal illness. And, Oh, this is what it's like to be a listener to a fork in time. I can be a listener to my own podcast, which is pretty cool. Chris, anything to share with the listeners before we close it out? Not particularly. Okay. Do you encourage you to visit the website. Uh, that's a chance to throw in those topics, those suggestions uh, to support the podcast, all the things that go on there, www.aforkintobpodcast.com. Uh, if you haven't been there recently, updated the bios to some degree and some of the roles that people are doing now as we've added uh, some people to the team. The production team is like seven or eight now when you look across who who can be part of or producing an episode, which to me is pretty exciting. 
uh, but I always sort of go in. This is almost like going back old school now when it's just Chris and I. That's you know that that, that goes back further. So it's <laughs> so that's still sort of cool. And he he hopped in today with uh, with being able to participate on this episode. So. I'm required by, I don't know if it's by law or by practice or by just not getting in trouble with the powers that be, Chris, but we have to tell our listeners what we think they should do if they encounter a fork in time. Any thoughts? Take it. I think they should take it. Have a good day, guys. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.